And we are live. So good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And today is a little bit of all three of those, which is really, really exciting as we wrap up November with just a few more, uh, few more sessions before we wrap up. Uh, so before I introduce our amazing speaker today, I'm going to go one by one through each class, give you guys a chance to do a bit of a shout out. So first, we've got Miss Worth, grade fours in Calgary, Alberta. Hi, guys. Hey! <laughs> I love the arms up in the air. All right. We've got Mr. Ashford's five sixes in Toronto in Ontario. Hi, guys. Oh, let's unmute your mic. It doesn't want me to unmute your mic, so I'll turn to you guys and we can just see you. Hi, guys. How you doing? <laughs> There we go. <laughs> so yes, you'll need to unmute your own mic for whatever reason. It's being goofy, but that's okay. We've got Miss Rodriguez as grade sixes in Toronto, Ontario. Hi, guys. You're so famous. <laughs> hey, famous. Yes. Oh, all famous. <laughs> awesome. Hey, guys. All right. <laughs> this is going to be an enthusiastic session today, I can tell. All right. We've got Miss Carton's grade fives in Anchorage in Alaska. Hi, guys. Hey, awesome. Our only US classroom today, that's exciting. We've got Miss Matthews, grade three fours in Curtin A and BC. Let me get them up. Hey! <laughs> uh, we've got Miss Lee. Oh, we've got Wellesley School. Wellesley Public School, uh, grade fours in Ontario. Let me just pull them up as well. There we go. Hi, guys. Oh, their mic not working either. They're there, they're excited. Okay, we got a bunch of classes where it's not letting me demute the mic. That keeps it exciting. The tech has to fail a little bit, otherwise it wouldn't be fun. And then Miss Stevens in grade fives in Calgary, Alberta as well. Hey guys. Hey, okay, everyone's enthusiastic today. All right, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speakers. We are joined live in Banff National Park by Carolyn Hayden. And she is going to explain to us a little bit about Banff National Park on the whole, one of the most iconic and amazing landscapes in Canada and indeed the entire world. And specifically, she's going to dive into their program to reintroduce bison to Banff National Park. So I don't want to spoil it. There's a lot of really, really neat stuff here. We're so thrilled to have you back, Carolyn. Thanks so much for joining us and take it away. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, like the Fido commercial. Yay! Well, hi everybody, this is so exciting. You definitely are famous. Uh, and I'm, I'm so happy you guys were able to join us from all across Canada and hi to Alaska, welcome. And hi, of course, to everyone uh, watching on YouTube. My name is Caroline Hayden and I am a conservation educator with Parks Canada right here in the beautiful Banff National Park. Now put your hands up if you've been to a national park before. Awesome, that's so cool. Uh, so today we're coming to you from Canada's very first national park with something very special. So today we're gonna be going behind the scenes to tell you all about the five steps that we're taking to bring bison back to Banff National Park. And one more show of hands, who knows what a bison is? That's pretty good. A lot of them. Who knows the difference between a bison and a buffalo? Pretty good. We could talk about that one after. <laughs> and if you've never had a chance to see a bison before, oh, where, can you see my, oh, here. Yeah, we're good. We got it up. We're good. Oh, oh perfect. Perfect. If you have never seen a bison before, uh, here's three in front of you right here. So these are three bison uh, roaming in the backcountry of Banff National Park. Uh, so before we get into the meat of things, I would like to do something really important. And that is to respectfully acknowledge that right here in Banff National Park, we are standing on the traditional territory of the Treaty 6 seven and eight First Nations, along with the Métis Nation of Alberta. So we thank these peoples for their stewardship and for sharing the land with us today. And here's where that land is. So this, for, Cana for the Canadian schools, uh, should look familiar. This is a map of Canada. And for the classroom from Alaska, this is Canada. And you can see Alaska there on the side. But this is not your average map. 
So this map here shows us all of the national parks across Canada. That's us right there uh, in Banff, right in the Rocky Mountains. So I know we have classrooms from across Canada. So if if you if all of you guys could just take a few seconds and try to find the national park that's closest to your school. Don't just share it, but just try to point it up. Nice. So if you've if you've uh, not had a chance to visit all of the, all of our 47 national parks, that's okay. You've got lots of time. Uh, but each national park is very different and unique. And we have a special job here in Parks Canada to make sure that we're protecting these places for future generations. So part of that work is to make sure the ecosystems in each of these national parks are healthy and whole. So we have a team of scientists who have the coolest job uh, and they go out into the field to monitor the health of our ecosystems. And sometimes they notice pieces that are missing and we work really hard to restore them. And the thing that was missing here in Banff was bison. So when people think of Banff National Park, we are such an iconic place, uh, but people generally, generally think of big glaciers and mountains, which we definitely have, but bison's not the first thing that comes to mind. But for 10,000 years, bison, like the ones right in front of you, traveled the valleys and up to the mountain tops of the Rocky Mountains. But before the park was even created, so about 140 years ago, bison disappeared. So we've had to use as a lot of detective work to really understand how bison traveled through this landscape and what their story in Banff is all about. So we've looked to indigenous oral history, uh, explorers journals of some of the first uh, European travelers to come through this place. And coolest of all is archaeology. So I'm actually going to uh, pan over to our other uh, camera here. Uh oh, there we go. Uh, and I'm going to show you something really cool. Now I'm, I'm the one that gets to press all the buttons. <laughs> Can you see the bone okay? Is that popping up? Great. Yeah, it's fantastic. So this here is a bison bone. I actually uh, was walking along a stream a couple of years ago here in Banff and looked down and saw this at my feet. And I knew right away that it was probably a bison bone. And for, I knew that for a few reasons. First of all, uh, it's super big, as you can see here. It's about the size of my arm. And as as I looked more closely, you can really see that there is some discoloration. So it's kind of got this beautiful old color coppering. So what I did is I took it back to our lab, to our team of archeologists. And uh, what they did is they actually took a sample. So you can see here, that there's a, a, about 10 centimeters missing. Uh, so they cut out this sample, they sent it to a lab, they powdered the bone. And they did that to tell us some secrets that this bone holds. So they did a DNA test to make sure that it really was bison, which it is. But they also uh, did what's called a radiocarbon dating analysis. So basically, uh, they do an analysis that looks at how old uh, the bone is approximately uh, based on what the carbon tells us. And this very bone was over 2,000 years old. Uh, so pieces like this, we found skulls right on top of uh, mountain passes, deep under uh, um, shorelines. And evidence like this helps us understand how a missing species may have used this place. And you're back. No, you're good. I'm good. Okay. We're seeing you, not, not your presentation, just you right now. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so I'm the one that gets to, to, to press all the buttons. Um, great. So that's one tool. And the story of bison here is part of a greater story of bison across North America. 
So the map that you see right in front of you uh, is a traditional map of the historical range of bison. So there's a lot of colors here, so I'll just break them down for you. So on the, the orange part, so that's on the north part of the map, that's the traditional range of what's called the wood bison. Uh, there's two cousins of bison. And their territory stretch from Edmonton and Alberta all the way up through Alaska. So Alaska schools, this would have been the bison uh, that traveled through your neighborhood. And uh, the brown uh, color on the map represents the plains bison. So that's what we're talking about today. And that's what you think about when you think of the buffalo of the Wild West. Uh, their territory was huge. So all the way from Edmonton down to Mexico, all the way east to Florida, and all the way west to the Continental Divide. And right there on that arrow is where we are here in Banff. So we're right at the edge of that traditional range. Now, it's so unimaginable, but this photo or this uh, drawing uh, is something that you would have seen uh, maybe for schools in Calgary, if you looked out your window along the Bow River, you might have seen herds of bison as far as the eye could see. So this, uh, this drawing is a bit of an exaggeration, uh, but it was very common to see giant herds of bison, about like even as big as 100,000 in a herd. So stretching far into the horizon, you would have heard their footsteps shaking the ground, smelled them in the air, and they really shaped uh, the plains landscape that we know today. So our best estimates um, is that bison numbered as high as 30 million uh, at their peak, which is about the amount of people that we have here in Canada. Uh, and they were at that time the most numerous land mammal in North America. And even more unimaginable is the fact that we almost lost them. So this photo for me just really says it all. This, this pyramid is made out of bison skulls. So just take a moment just to, just to soak that in. Can you imagine how many skulls are in this pile? So as uh, Europeans colonized North America and headed west, they left behind piles of bones like this. And we very nearly lost bison due to this overhunting. So we went from 30 million bison to less than a thousand bison. So about the amount of people that might live on a single city block. So the, the uh, it's so, we're so lucky that we didn't completely lose them. And they disappeared from Banff, but we started a project to bring them back. Uh, so these are some of the reasons why it's so important. Ecology. So bison are what's called keystone species or ecosystem engineers. So that means that through the things that bison do, uh, they benefit hundreds of other species uh, in their ecosystem. So for example, songbirds will take bison fur and use it to keep their chicks warm in the nest. And they also en enhance uh, grazing habitat for other grazers like elk. Connection's really important. Part of our job here is to bring conservation stories to kids like you across North America and visitors from around the world uh, to get excited about what we're doing and excited about conservation. And this is one of those stories. And probably most importantly is the cultural component. So bison and people uh, shared the landscape for thousands of years and reconnecting that human bison uh, connection is really important for the work that we're doing. History, we just talked about that. Uh, bison have been here for 10,000 years and they belong here. And lastly, uh, Parks Canada has been leading the charge to give bison a second chance. Uh, we've been protecting bison for over 100 years and this is one more step uh, to lead bison into the future. And it all started with step one. Uh, so our first step was to get bison from Elk Island National Park, which is another national park just outside of Edmonton for, for the kids in Calgary. And 
Elk Island National Park protects a seed herd of conservation bison that we use here in Parks Canada to start new herds uh, throughout their historical range. So what we did uh, is we picked 16 bison from their healthy herd to start our project in Banff. But before we actually transported the bison, we had to give them some very special jewelry. So we're gonna pop back over to our other camera uh, so I can show you what that looked like. Perfect. That's our bison bone again. And this here is a bison horn. So bison horns are really special because uh, they'll keep them for their whole lives, unlike a deer, which will lose its antlers every single year. So a bison horn is made out of the same material that our fingernails are made out of. It's called keratin. And they'll grow new layers on their horn every single year. So over time, it kind of starts to look like tree rings. We can take a closer look at that. Uh, so based on uh, the rings that I'm seeing here on this uh, horn, uh, it's a female bison that was probably 12 to 15 years old. And then if we look at the other side, the other end is very pokey. Uh, so bison will use their horns for a number of different things and most importantly, defense. So using these sharp pointy horns, they can protect themselves and their young against predators. But sometimes they can accidentally hurt each other. So before we brought the bison to Banff, we wanted to make sure that they arrived safe and sound. So we used a high tech piece of technology, duct tape and garden hose. Uh, so what we did is while we were giving the bison um, some tests, we actually duct taped a piece of hose to the end of their horn, just like that. Um, so that when they were being transported, instead of poking each other with their sharp horns, they would just gently touch each other with this squishy tube. And it really worked because they all arrived uh, safe and sound. And this was some high tech technology in action to make it happen. Back. Do, do. Very cool. So after we had given the bison uh, the fancy jewels, we actually loaded them up into these uh, custom shipping containers uh, and we had like a fleet of trucks filled with bison uh, and we started a road trip that would take us from Elk Island all the way to the border of Banff National Park. So we had a major challenge to overcome with this project to get the bison into where we wanted to reintroduce them in the park in the deep back country because there was no roads. So we actually had to fly in a helicopter that picked up each and every one of these boxes gently filled with bison and fly them about uh, 20 kilometers, 40 kilometers into uh, the back country of Banff National Park. So we actually installed a GoPro into, into the containers to keep an eye on the bison to make sure that they were doing okay because they were on this wild journey. Uh, and so this footage was taken uh, during that flight. So it was pretty cool. And as you can see, they were pretty relaxed. And then the big moment came, all of those uh, containers we were lowered into the park and we opened up all of the doors and bison took their first wild steps in Banff in 140 years. It was such a special thing to see. And in this photo, you can really see those horn tubes front and center. And they've all since fallen off. Um, then came step two, to care for the herd. So, we wanted to give our bison the best chance for success in their new home. So what we did is what's called a soft release. So we actually held the bison in an enclosure to help them learn some mounting skills before we release them fully into the wild. So that's our herd right there in the heart of Banff's backcountry. And for a year and a half, our staff had a, a very, very special job. They were there to take care of our bison herd. 
Uh, so we have a patrol cabin and we had someone staffed there 24 hours a day, um, monitoring the herd and really learning about them as individuals. And during their time with us, um, the bison had two rounds of calves. They added 20 new healthy babies to the herd, which was such a cool thing. Um, and, and pretty rare to have such uh, a large number of, her of calves join the herd. And calving is really important to help bison really anchor to their new home. And while they were in Banff, they had a lot to learn because they came from Elk Island, which, which uh, is pretty flat. It has no moving rivers. So they had to learn how to cross a river, drink from a river. They had to learn how to climb steep mountain slopes. And in that photo, that's a, a one day old baby uh, following mom. They're really just so resilient and incredible to watch out on the landscape. And before we released them, we, we uh, gave all of the adults uh, a GPS radio collar to help us learn more about them as they took their first steps truly in the wild. And then came step three, to actually release the bison. I got to be here for this moment uh, where we cut the fence open that had held them for a year and a half and gave them their freedom. So we cut the fence, and then we waited and we waited and we waited and we just figured that they would find the opening and, and get out there as fast as possible, but darkness came. And so we had to go to bed. And sure enough, in the very middle of the night, the herd left the enclosure single file, uh, making a jailbreak. Uh, and the next morning, this is what they woke up to. Some of the most rugged remote valleys in such an iconic landscape and in this landscape you're more likely to run into a wolf than you are a, a human being so we went out that morning to try to see where they went and we were scanning the valley bottom we didn't see them but we since they have those collars we know that they're around so we start looking up way up and finally we start to find them right on the tippy top of the mountain, which is not where you'd expect to see a bison. So under uh, that red circle is actually a cow, the two cows and their two day old calves. And they stayed right on that ridge line for a couple of weeks, eating these tiny tendrils of grass. We looked on mountainsides and we found them. <laughs> right in sheep habitat, right where the barren rock is meeting uh, the grass. Pretty phenomenal. And this is just in their first week. So we released the herd in uh, two summers ago. And since their time in the wild, uh, they just blow us away every single day. We're, we're always learning something new. Uh, and it feels like we are rediscovering a new species. We're learning, for instance, that they're spending a lot of time up in high alpine habitat. So this is up on a mountain pass, uh, which is sheep or goat habitat traditionally. And we're noticing that as soon as the snow is melting, they are getting high up in the alpine and pretty much staying there all summer long until the snows come uh, that force them back down into the valley. So this is this is the kind of habitat that they're in uh, today even. We just had a snowfall uh, last night. So this is probably what they're waking up to this morning. And uh, this was taken late in the fall and you can just see how healthy they are. Like we're, we're very hands off at this point. We're not feeding them. Uh, they're finding their own food. Uh, they're building their herd dynamics and their coats are glistening and they really are reintegrating into this place. And so now we're on step four. And it, we're, as I mentioned, we're learning so much about them. So we actually send our staff out into the field uh, every few weeks to get a visual observation on the herd. And uh, we use something called telemetry. So as I meant, as I showed you, all of those, the adults have uh, these GPS collars and each collar sends out its own unique signal. So kind of like a radio station. 
So when we go out into the field, because the backcountry is so big and uh, bison are relatively small, we can use what's called a, a telemetry receiver, which is kind of like tuning into a radio station in your car to pick up the individual signal of each bison. And then we can get an idea of where they are um, on, uh, in their habitat. And then we can get close enough uh, while keeping our distance to collect uh, observational data about the herd. And uh, this is just a quick animation. So it, they also upload that, uh, that location information via satellite uh, to a program that we can access from the computer. So we're able to see with really specific detail where they're spending time, what kind of habitat they're spending time in. And um, as the seasons go by, we'll be able to get a better idea of their seasonal patterns and potentially their migratory patterns within um, the park. And it's just so exciting because it's, this uh, experiment is unfolding right in front of our eyes. And this just gives you an idea of uh, where the bison are spending time. Uh, so, so far we're noticing that uh, they're spending most of their time in the north part of the habitat that we've released them into. Uh, and the town of Banff is just right down at the bottom of the map there. So hopefully they'll explore a bit more as time passes. And we're already starting to see changes on the ground. So in meadows like this, bison are leaving behind these beautiful uh, dung patties, which sounds kind of gross, but they're full of nutrients that help fertilize the soil and provide habitat for animals like insects. They're grazing, which creates beautiful new grass. They're, provide, they're increasing habitat. And we're so excited to see the changes that we'll see uh, as uh, the reintroduction continues. And for me, it's so powerful to go out into, this, into these places and look down and to be walking in the footsteps of bison, a species that nearly went extinct, that had been missing from Banff National Park for over a century. And to see that, uh, that right in front of you, it's like seeing the impossible uh, happening right before your eyes. Uh, so it's a very special thing to be a part of. And finally, our last step is your step, uh, and it's to follow the herd. So there's some ways that, ways that you can learn more about what our bison are doing. And the first way is to watch our backcountry web series. So we actually send our scientists out into the backcountry with a camera to record their day-to-day -day of working with the bison. And we made a short web series that you can find uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, so our challenge to you is to watch all of our videos. They're under five minutes each. Pick your class's favorite and share it on social media. You can tag us at Banff and P, use hashtag Banff Bison, and we'll get one of our scientists to respond to you with their favorite memory of working with the bison. We also share photos and news stories on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, again, on our YouTube channel, you, there's so many ways that you can see what our bison are up to. And we also have a blog that we, uh, we post new photos and stories on about every month or so. Uh, so we'll have one coming up in a couple of weeks here. So be sure to check that out too. And now um, let's talk bison questions. Um, what what do you guys want to know more about? I'll pass this back over to Jesse. All right, thank you so so much for that. That was fantastic, um, Carolyn. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Uh, and for our classes, I'll pass along all those resources once we're done, so you guys can easily check out uh, all those things: the Twitter page, the Facebook page, the YouTube page, all of it. Uh, but yeah, let's dive in with questions. I want to note too, we have at least five classes watching on YouTube and some more hopefully too. So just let me know where you guys are joining from, pass along some questions, and I'll take as many as I can. Let's start with Ms. Worst class. If you guys want to kick us off with a question, come on up. Let's see you go. Oh, your audio isn't working. We've got your video, but no audio right now. I don't know why. I've got you demuted. Come on up, come on up. There you go. Yeah, I think you're good. Maybe? Kind of, sort of? Okay. You know what I'll do? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Perfect. Okay. Go for it. Can you 
Can you repeat it a little closer to the camera? No, it's really light. So, Ms. Worth, could you repeat what the question is? Have you ever specifically been with the bison yourself? Ah, have you ever specifically been with the bison yourself, Carolyn? Oh, absolutely. So I, um, I get to work really closely with our scientists on the ground. So I got to go out um, in the first days where we had our very first calf born in the backcountry, and it was snowing, and there's snow all in the backs of the bison, and got to see this little baby, um, and they're bright red. It's so cute, um, moving around with the herd. Um, so it was very cool to be able to be out there. Um, so close to the bison and, and see uh, their behaviors and watch them, you know, looking up and watching a cloud go by. Uh, they have such a, uh, a curious nature and uh, they have this power about them. Um, so it's, if you've never seen a bison before, um, there's definitely some places where you can. It's not so easy to see them in the backcountry of Banff, but if you are near Edmonton, Elk Isle National Park, protects over a thousand bison. And we have uh, parks across the country where you can go and safely uh, see a bison in the wild, um, like Prince Albert National Park, um, Riding Mountain House National or National Historic Site. So there's definitely ways where you can get that special experience of being uh, in the same place as a bison. It's very, very cool. Very cool. Thank you so much, Carolyn. And I can attest to Elk Island for our classes in Calgary, three hours north. They're right on the side of the road at the park. They're amazing. Um, all right, Mr. Ashford's group, if you guys have a question, come on up. Oh, and your mic demuting is working now, so you should be just good to go. Um, when did you decide you wanted to work with the bison? That is a great question. I, they totally came to me. I work, actually work for Elk Island National Park. I knew nothing about bison. Um, I, for all I knew, they had gone extinct, uh, but I started working for Elk Island National Park and it's, it's such a rich landscape. And I actually lived in the park and uh, they had bison, I had bison on my front lawn. Um, you could hear them snoring outside on the lawn at night. Um, and then the more I started learning about them and you learn about their history and their relationship with culture and how we nearly lost them um, and how important they are in the ecosystem. And then I was hooked. So I've been studying bison for about 10 years now uh, and no, no sign of stopping uh, anytime in the near future. Very cool. I think for our next session with you, we need an audio of a snoring bison, okay? We'll try and work I'll on I'll work that. on that. <laughs> um, all right, Ms. Rodriguez's is class. Come on up, guys. Go ahead. Um, have you named any bison? <laughs> <laughs> I like the gesticulating. <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> have I named any bison? Well, here uh, in Banff, we try not to name them so they can stay as wild as possible. Um, but for our herd here in Banff, we actually <coughs> gave them ear tag numbers. And you might have seen that in some of the photos. And that helps us track individuals because they all have their own personalities. Some are more shy, some are more bold. So we get to know them uh, by their numbers. So we have a couple of bison in the herd, females number 11 and 12, they were very bold. Um, and then we had a, a younger calf who was actually born in Banff, uh, number 25, I believe, or 24. And he's so adventurous and playful and he would try to um, unlock the gate to get out when we had them in the enclosure. Uh, so they have these really quirky, unique personalities. So having the numbers really helps, but we try not to give them actual human names. Very cool. All right. Uh, I'm going to pass along a question from a YouTube group. So Mr. Dodis's and Ms. McClellan's class in Mississauga grade twos wanted to ask, are bison dangerous to people, Carolyn? That's another good question. Um, so like any animal, um, bison can be dangerous if you don't give them enough space. And that goes for deer and squirrels and any other animal. So we want to, bison are vegetarians by nature. They're not trying to eat people by any means. Um, and the most important thing to do is to give them enough space so that they feel safe. They have a, a big personal space. We all have those personal bubbles. They have a big one. 
Um, so bison can be very safe as long as you respect their space. So we, we recommend staying about 100 meters away. And you can use the rule of thumb. So if you are in a place where there are bison and you stick your um, arm out long, if you can cover the full bison with your thumb, you're probably far enough away. Uh, but you always want to be monitoring the behavior. If they look like um, they're noticing you, their tails are up, um, it's good to give them a give them as much space as you can. Um, so if you are ever in a place where there might be bison, be sure to bring your binoculars uh, and make sure you're watching because there might be a bison around the corner. And you just want to uh, make sure that they know you're there and that you give them as, as much space as you can. I'm really glad that message got brought up and that's something that we hear in, in interactions with a lot of people that work with large animals like they're fantastic they're not to be feared but just give them respect and, and so fantastic thank you so much all right i miss curtain's class come on up guys what is your favorite kind of bison Ooh. Ooh. the difference between bison and buffalo yes. yeah okay so bison and buffalo we'll take the difference there and then do you have a favorite i mean might be the ones that you work with but is there something else that's a little different Okay, cool. Well, let's do bison versus buffalo. Um, essentially, they're the same thing. Buffalo is just the um, the casual term for bison, whereas bison is the scientific name. But you can use either interchangeably. I definitely do. Um, but you, there are uh, buffalo that live in different places. So in, in Asia and Africa, so the Cape Horn buffalo and the water buffalo, you can't call them bison. But, any, but if you see a bison in Canada or in, in the United States, you can use either term and you're okay. Um, and then for my favorite bison, oh man, I have to say it's our Banff bison. They're so, um, they're so adventurous. They're climbing mountains. Um, they are following in the footsteps of their ancestors and they're, they are on this um, wild adventure. And it's so neat to be able to watch that happening in real time. Very cool. I figured as much, but we're glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right, uh, Miss Matthews class. Come on up, guys. Hey. Hi, my name is Lacey. I'm from Courtney, BC. Were, were there other similar pr programs or different animals for different animals in this national park or others? Yeah. Were there other similar programs? Yeah, conservation programs in other national parks, or are we introducing anything back else into Banff? Great question. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so here in Banff, bison is our 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 big conservation or reintroduction project. Um, but we're often reintroducing missing pieces at parks across the country. Uh, so in Grasslands National Park, we're working really hard to reenter or restore a working relationship between prairie dogs and black-footed ferrets. So that's a big project that we're working on. Uh, of course, we're working towards restoring caribou as well in the Rocky Mountains um, and protecting the ones that are still there in Jasper National Park. Um, but we protect them all, big and small, in every single national park. So here in Banff too, we work to protect our endemic snail uh, the Banff string snail, you can hardly see them, uh, but we work really hard to protect their habitat because uh, we want to make sure that in each and every one of our national parks, we have all of the, the species and the processes like prescribed fire uh, that make uh, each national park healthy and full. So they're all equally as important, but bison are by far the most important. <laughs> equal but not so much we, we've actually yeah. <laughs> had a fantastic presentation with Banff with you guys before on, on West Slope cutthroat trout so on a fishery introduction there in Banff as well really amazing guys and I encourage the class to check that out too um, a quick question from our class on YouTube so Miss Kosick and Miss Spooner's class joining us from Sioux Lookout in Ontario way to go guys and nice to have you in from so far up north uh, they wanted to ask in fact specifically Deanna and Sophia wanted to ask how long the lifespan for bison Oh, another good question. It depends on where they're living. Uh, so for bison in captivity, they can live upwards of 30 years. Uh, but in the wild where they're having to fend for themselves and, and survive winters and, and defend themselves against predators, 
Um, their lifespan's a little bit shorter, so between 15 and 20 years, give or take. So they actually live quite a long time. And uh, what's actually really cool is um, as bison are herd animals and the older animals um, are learning year to year on where the best food is, where to go from season to season. And what we're noticing and something that we're actually studying with our Banff bison here is they'll actually teach younger bison. So there's knowledge sharing from generation to generation. So when you have an old bison that's 20 years old, they have a lot of knowledge to share with the generations to come. So that's something that we're gonna be studying uh, with our BAMP herd as well. Super cool, all right. Let's go to Wellesley Public School for the multiple classes that are there. You guys have one? Come on up. Oh, you had your mic demuted. Oh, and are you good? good? Yep, you're good. <laughs> How many buffalo are, are in the park? Ah. So oh. our, to our best knowledge, we have about 35 bison uh, here in Banff. Um, now that they're out in the wild, we really depend on being able to get out there and get a, a full visual count of all the bison. Um, but because they're, they're truly wild, um, we, we won't be able to have the, the same level of knowledge of how many bison there are and where exactly they are as we did when we had them in the enclosure, which is actually kind of exciting. They're, they're becoming uh, more wild and, uh, and way more um, anonymous like other animals in the park like elk or, or bears uh, as they just become part of the ecosystem. So, that's, so to answer your question, about 35. Yeah, very cool. All right. And then last but not least for our live classes in round one, Miss Stevenson's group. Come on up, guys. How do you do that? Everybody you know, got a how, do you, how do you track but like young bison gives well ones if they get lost? Yeah. What happens if a young bison gets lost? Well, how do you um, track? Will they stick yeah. how do we track them? Um, so we really, we tolerate the adult bison. Um, so because younger bison tend to stick with the older bison, if we know where the adults are in the herd, you have a really good idea of where the younger animals will be. Because they tend to, for the first part of their lives, they tend to stick really close to mom and they form these little family groups, kind of like elephants. Um, so we, because we want to make sure that the bison are as wild as possible, we want to really minimize how much impact that we have on the herd. Uh, so we don't want to collar every single bison, uh, but just enough to give us an idea of what the herd is doing and, and, uh, and where they are on the landscape. But uh, the bison are really good at kind of keeping track of the little ones and protecting them. And uh, so far what we're noticing with our BAMP herd is the full herd kind of moves together uh, with a few little kind of side adventures. Uh, but uh, where we know where some of them are, it's generally where the whole herd is hanging out. All right, awesome. Uh, there's been a qu bunch of questions from groups on YouTube. So Jenna in uh, Miss uh, Huxley's class in Brampton and a few other classes, Mr. Dotis's class too, wanted to ask, how did you get these horn covers on the bison. Uh, was it hard to do? Did anyone get hurt when you were doing that? Seems like a risky proposition. Oh, goodness. I wish I had a photo. Oh, I guess I, oh, we can send around a photo after potentially. Um, but when we got them from Elk Island National Park, um, they actually have uh, what's called a handling facility. So it's a system of corrals to get these wild bison uh, into single file eventually so that we can uh, give them ear tags if we need to, test them for diseases to make sure they're healthy. Um, and so we'll actually get them in what's called a squeeze, um, which allows us to safely interact with the animals where they're, um, they're in basically like a very small room that keeps them more or less still so that uh, when we're giving them an ear tag that they can stay nice and calm and that the bison stays safe but our staff stay safe too. So we gave them the horn tubes while they were safely in this little um, bison room called a squeeze. And then um, it was pretty safe and easy for both us and the bison to actually get in there. Uh, we had a, uh, a team of 
specialist, be it a vet, a vet um, specialist is there as well, just to make sure everything was going smoothly. And then um, really just duct taped the horn tube right onto the, to the horn. Um, and then the bison were released and, and um, went back out to join the herd. Uh, so it went really well, it was nice and safe. And uh, hopefully if other uh, reintroductions are hoping to transport bison, uh, that they can take our high-tech tool um, to, to help their reintroduction stay safe as well. Outstanding. All right. So I know we're getting to the end of some periods for some of the classes and some of them have to go. So we're going to take a few quick questions. We're going to find out how classes can ask more questions to you guys directly, and then we'll wrap up. So Mr. Ashford's class, I'm just going to pick some at random. So please don't hurt me. Uh, Mr. Ashford's class, if you guys want to come up and ask a question, go for it. <laughs> hey, let's go. Okay. <laughs> um, do all bison, like, do they, do they have one main food or do they eat lots of food? Yeah. Ooh, um, you guys are, are such good little scientists. Uh, bison are what's called a grazer. Uh, primarily they eat grass, um, but they also eat a bunch of other, like, called leafy plants, like flowers, wildflowers, and bushes. And we're actually trying to get a better idea of what exactly our bison are eating. So when our staff are out in the field, we're actually collecting dung samples or scat samples. So we'll collect uh, a bit of bison poop, uh, bring it back to um, our lab and analyze it to see what types of plants our bison have been eating. Uh, so we'll get back to you. We're still gathering our data, um, but we should have a better idea as the years go by. But on the whole, bison spend most of their day eating grass. All right. Um, just because I love we have a group from Sioux Lookout joining us, I want to pass on one more question from them on YouTube. So Logan and Arianna want to know, how much does a baby bison weigh? You'd already said that they don't get collared, so it's just adults, but how much do they weigh? Well, they oh, baby bison are amazing. When they're born, they're up and standing within 10 minutes. They're running within an hour. And they're really similar in size to a medium-sized dog or like a baby deer. Uh, and then they grow really quickly. Um, so they can, they can be up to 2,000 pounds when they're a grown adult bison. Uh, so they grow quickly and uh, they're up and at them right away. They're incredible. Super cool. All right. We'll I'll wrap up with one last question from Ms. Matthews' class. If you guys want to come up, go for it to wrap us up. Hi, my name is Eva, and my question is, what kind of technology can help you on this um, kind of project? Ooh. Um, are you looking to reintroduce bison yourself? <laughs> um, well, we use a, a whole range of technology. So some of them we went over in the presentation. So we use GPS collars uh, to track their location. Um, something we didn't talk about, but we use a lot of remote cameras uh, out on the landscape because it's, they're roaming such a big area. Our scientists can't be everywhere at all times. So we have a network of remote cameras that will, like when something walks in front of it, it will take a picture. So that can give us an idea of which bison are traveling together. We can get a close up look at how healthy they are. And sometimes you can even see interactions between uh, bison and other species captured on camera. So that's something we, we use a lot of. Um, and then we use a lot of um, unexpected technology like the horn tubes that we've been talking about. And then we have um, some wildlife friendly fencing that we use on the edge of the bison uh, reintroduction zone to um, help redirect the bison back into the core of their habitat until they're really able to adopt it as their new home. So that's some, some of the ways that we use uh, technology to monitor the herd. And we're actually gonna have a new blog post all about the behind the scenes technology coming out on our blog uh, in mid-December. So be sure to check that one out too. Very cool. All right, uh, Carolyn, before we wrap up, 
I just wanted to ask, because there's more questions that we could probably take in one session. Is there a place amidst all the things that you share with us where kids can ask questions? We can either share them to you via email if you're okay with that, or if there's a way that people can do this on the site, let me know and, and then they can follow up more. There's two ways that you can do it. You can, um, you can tag us at BAMPNP on social media and we'll get back to you there. Or you can um, email me. My contact number is right on our website, which is, um, and Jesse can share that as well, which is parkscanada.gc.ca slash BAMP bison. It's a mouthful, but if you just Google BAMP bison, our website comes up right away and our contact information is right there. So if, if you have any more burning bison questions, we can help you out. And don't forget to watch our, our Backcountry Science Bison web series. That's on our YouTube channel. And again, our challenge to you guys is to watch all five episodes, share your favorite one on social media, and one of our scientists will get back to you with their favorite moment from being in the field. So very cool, uh, don't, don't miss it. And be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter to see uh, what's new with the herd as they return to the landscape. Very cool. And again, the classes are all going to get that on uh, an email when we're done. So do check that out. And if you have a favorite, let us know too. We love to hear those sort of things. All right, uh, Carolyn, at the end of every session, as you know, what I'm going to do is demute everyone's microphone. So boys and girls, if you guys can get ready to join me and saying a huge thank you to Carolyn for joining us today, you are all now demuted. <laughs> Right, thank you. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, we look so forward to having you guys back soon. Is check out the BAMP session going in our newsletter tonight. So you can check out a little bit more of a special session from BAMP. It's going to be a little bit different, which is cool. Uh, until then, have a lovely rest of your day. Thanks so much, Carolyn, for joining us once again. Bye, everybody. <laughs>